What's up YouTube? My name is Sean and I make real estate easy. And in today's video, I actually want to talk about some of the more popular shorts that got upwards of 17 million views and actually break down exactly what I'm trying to convey and answer some of your questions here on the video. So without further ado, let's hop on in. All right, kids, I'm giving you $100 each. Be smart and don't spend it all in one place. Oh boy, I'm buying all the candy today. What are you doing with your money? Well, that's such to be smart with this money. So I'm going to hold on and invest. See, most kids, when they get money, the first thing they want to do is spend it on candy, toys, video games. But if you can have financial discipline from a very early age, the power of compound interest will actually increase your wealth tremendously. You teens have been doing a great job. I've spoken to upper management and we're going to give you guys a raise. Oh yeah, time to get a new car. Hey, Billy, you want to get a matching sports car with me? Most people who get a raise end up spending that money so they're left with the same amount of savings every single month no thanks i'm gonna pretend like i never got the raise and i'm gonna invest a difference whereas if you're a little bit smarter like billy is what you should be doing is pretending like you never got the raise and letting yourself save and invest more because the more money that you invest and the earlier you do it the more money you're gonna have in the long run you guys have been doing a great job here are your yearly bonuses all right it's time to upgrade the pool of my house hey billy let me guess i'm gonna invest it actually i'm gonna spend it in fact this is my last paycheck here since i'm retiring come on we've been earning the same amount of money our entire lives and I barely have $30,000 saved. How are you able to retire? People can have the exact same salaries, come from the exact same backgrounds, but based on their financial choices can be in completely different places. I've been investing as much as I could for the past 30 years and my investments have now grown to over $1.5 million. I saw you spend a lot of money on nice cars and fancy apartments, but I knew that if I kept saving and investing that my net worth would eventually skyrocket. Now I'm able to retire early and I even picked up a sweet house along the way. Wow, now I wish I invested with you instead of making fun of you for all these years. So this video got me 17 15 million views. It's my highest view video on YouTube today. We decided to take a look at some of the most popular comments and answer them here in this video. The first one is, how can you invest $100 and make a good profit out of it though? But in reality, $100 really won't get you that far. So the point is to invest consistently on a regular basis and invest early. All right, the next question, how does a little kid know what investing is? It's a skip, bro. <laughs> Most kids probably won't know what investing is, but that's why I create content on my channel. That's why I make shorts, reels, and TikToks to hopefully encourage people to understand a little bit about personal finance. Topic asks, what are you investing in though? So most of our investments are in mutual funds and ETFs. And of course, we have a large portfolio in real estate. As far as the actual stocks are concerned, you know, I do like buying these high tech stocks like Apple, Google, etc. But we like buying index funds and ETFs because it gives us all this diversity in one package. Dylan's asking, what about inflation? And that's a great point. Actually, the whole point of investing is to beat inflation. So when you have your money just in savings and every single year, the inflation is going up by 3%, you're actually losing the value of your money by holding your money in cash. But by investing it, you're actually growing it by 8, 9, 10% a year which is actually beating inflation. Yeah, so have y'all ever heard of stocks crashing? And yes, stocks definitely do crash, which is why you need to have a diversified portfolio. Like we don't invest all of our money into one company's stock. We're investing in different sectors of the market. So if maybe if tech goes down, maybe healthcare go up, stuff like that. AW says, I'm afraid it's too late for Timmy. He's no longer little. He will be in his 60s to achieve what Billy has right now. That's true, but also there's a saying that says, the best time to plant a tree was 50 years ago. The next best time is today. So. You can wait another 50 years and live a life of mediocrity, or you can start today and eventually get to where Billy is. You miss the part where Billy becomes depressed and he has no friends and doesn't go outside during the prime time of his life. Of course, this concept was a little bit harsh, but in reality, most people do go out, but they're just more responsible with how they go out. All right, let's go to the next video. Team, I'd like you all to welcome our newest member, little Timmy. Hi, everybody. Well, this video is about hiring your kid and the tax benefits from doing so. Boss, why are you hiring this kid? Can he even do anything? Uh, First of all, he is my son. Ooh. And second of all, we're going to be paying him exactly $12,950 this year. This specific number is the exact standard deduction, which means that if you pay him this money, and they file their own taxes, they don't have to pay taxes on that money. That sounds like a lot of money. Look, I shouldn't be telling you this, but this is all part of the master plan to pay less taxes. Ooh, juicy. You see, by hiring him, I get to deduct his salary as a business expense, but he won't have to pay any taxes on the money that I give him because he can wipe all that out with a standard deduction. But basically by hiring my family member, I don't have to pay taxes at the highest bracket. Basically you keep more money in the family instead of paying the IRS. I get it. You're hiring your son for the exact amount the IRS lets you write off as a standard deduction. But won't there be suspicion 
suspicious that you're hiring a kid. I mean, look at him. He's eating his boogers. What can he even do for the company? Just to let you guys know, I did not actually eat my boogers when I filmed this skit. It was just for the video. I'm going to be using photos of Timmy all over our marketing materials, such as presentations to our investors. And it's not uncommon to pay models $12,000 a year, is it? I like it. Basically, if you're trying to hire a kid, you need to make sure that you're hiring them for something that's suitable for their age. So you can't just hire your son to be the CEO or something. It wouldn't really make sense. But as long as you hire them for something reasonable, like hire them as a model, putting their photos in your presentations and decks, then it's reasonable for their age and their skill set. Kokichi says, ah yes, child labor. I'm pretty sure child employment is illegal. Yay, child exploitation. Have you guys seen the latest Avatar movie? There were a lot of kids who were playing in that movie. So it's definitely not correct to say that child labor is illegal. Kids work all the time. It's just that you need to make sure it's reasonable. So you can't work them over time. You can't work them in sweatshops. Isn't that tax evasion? Seems like tax fraud to me. It's not tax evasion, which is illegal. This is called tax avoidance, which is legal. If you need the deduction that is. However, the IRS just released the new tax rates. The standard deduction this year is $13,800. So you get even more. Now, if you think Timmy is worth it, you can gift him up to $16,000 in 2022 and $17,000 in 2023. Now, I would say gifting is very different from hiring him because when you're gifting it, you are still paying the taxes on the money. You're just getting that money tax free. So let's move on to the third one. Son, I'm putting you in my will and I'm giving you the house. Dad, please don't do that. You don't want the property? I do. But if you just put me in your will, then I'm going to have to go through probate, which basically means that I'm going to have to go through a lawsuit to get the inheritance after you pass away. Mm. So probate sucks. It's basically where the court decides who gets what. But the thing is, because it's a courtroom, they take a long time to actually disperse everything. And it costs a lot more money in fees and takes around two to three years to do it. Well, that's no good. It could take up to two years to sort everything out. And I'll end up paying five to 8% of the value of the home in legal fees. So what should we do instead? Just put it in a revocable living trust. A revocable trust means that he can change the terms of the trust at any time. So if I'm a bad boy, he can just take my name off the trust or he can take the property out of the trust and I get nothing. And when you pass away, we won't have to go through probate and everything will transfer in private. That's Sounds like a great idea, son. You don't have to go through probate if you have a will. Now, if you do not have a will, you will have to go through probate. So I believe this is false. I believe even with a will, you have to go through probate, but probate will be a lot smoother than if you did not have a will and also went through probate. So having a will is better than having no will, but having a living trust is better than just having a will. Joel says, my wife's family went through something like this after her grandmother died. Somehow, no one ended up getting anything. There were two houses, a small business, and a bunch of investments. Some people in the family contested the will, went to court, and everyone ended up empty-handed. How can you avoid that? So again, in this case, maybe the will was unclear, or probate took too long, and the finances were just not maintained, and then all the properties were lost. The best way to avoid that is to have a living trust, have set instructions what happens when someone dies, have some funds set aside to continue making the mortgage payments if you somehow pass away suddenly. Sue says it might be different state to state. That's exactly true. So definitely consult a legal representative in your state. It took so many years to go through probate, and I was an only child. It took almost four years. By then, the mortgage holder refused to let me keep making payments and eventually I had to walk away from the house. So yes, listen to this guy. I'm so sorry to hear that. Usually when someone passes away, the lender will give the inheritor the chance to re-qualify for the mortgage. So if you're not making any income during that time, then they may not give you the mortgage and they might call the loan due, which says, hey, you have to pay the rest of the mortgage balance right now today. Dr. Jan says, if you clearly leave something to someone in your will, why would there be a lawsuit for them to claim it? That's just how the system works. William Lawson says, how about selling the property for a dollar to the son with a lifetime estate in the deed for yourself? I imagine that would be much cheaper. So yes, you could definitely sell your property for just $1 to your heir, but then the problem comes in something called step up in basis. So one of the benefits of owning real estate is that if you pass away, your heir gets a step up in basis so that if they sold the property at that price, they don't have to pay any taxes on any of the gains you made so far. If you sold the property early, you don't get this up on basis. So that's why this is not a viable strategy. I just tripped on your property and I know you're rich, so I'm gonna sue you to get my money. Real estate is the most litigious industry out there, meaning that if you're in real estate, there's a very high chance that you're gonna be sued at some point. You can try it, but it's not gonna work. We'll see about that. I'm gonna to talk to my lawyer. It's lawsuit time. He's right, there isn't a lot we can get, so it's not worth our time to sue. A lot of lawyers work on consignment, which means that they only get paid if you win the case. So they're gonna look at your thing, see if you have a case, and there's a low probability that you're gonna win, they're not even gonna bother with you. What do you mean? This guy owns a lot of real estate and I know he's loaded. He owns his property under an LLC. So even if we win, we're only gonna be able to get the equity that's in this one property. The whole point of creating an LLC is to separate your assets. So think about it like little buckets. If something really bad happens in this one bucket, your other properties and other buckets are completely separated from it. So you could potentially lose everything in this one bucket. So at least it won't spill over to the rest of the assets you have in your life. There's not much here because he has a big mortgage on it and we won't be able to go after any of the other assets that he owns. I'm sorry, sir, but this one just isn't worth our time. I also mentioned that he had a big mortgage on it. So in this case, because there was a large mortgage on the property, there just wasn't any equity for them to get. So if they sued and they won, 
the equity would only be very little because most of it is owned by the bank. Damn, how did you know how to protect your properties like this? I follow Sean, he makes real estate easy. I did that band-aid thing because there are a lot of people out there who BS injuries to win lawsuits. I think it's incredibly unethical. I think the law firms that represent these people are also despicable and they're just money grabbing people and they're not earning money in a legit way. So I have no sympathy for these people and I call them parasites. Leave a comment below what you think about people like this. So Nicholas Barari says, isn't that trespassing? Well, the funny thing about US law is that you can sue anyone for any reason. If anyone is thinking about doing this, lawyers are expensive and a rich person is going to stall as long as possible to make sure your finances are completely drained before even entering court. It's just not worth it unless the lawyer is 100% convinced that you have a worthy case. There are law firms out there who specialize in injury claims. And honestly, what the lawyer is gonna do is you're gonna look at your insurance policy look at your liability limit, and then go for that limit. Most insurance carriers just settle. They say, you know what? We don't want to bother going to court. You have somewhat of a reasonable claim. Here's a liability limit. Let's settle for some number between zero and our liability limit and call it a day. Mark says also home insurance, not only is the insurance company liable for any liability lawsuits relating to your property, the insurer will actually pay for your legal defense. Offer a small monthly fee. They'll even buy you a new house if yours gets destroyed by a massive tornado. It could be playing with fireworks, a plane crashing on it, or a meteorite impact. Does not cover damage due to flooding, terrorists, nuclear plant accidents, termites, Chinese evasion, sewer backup, earthquakes, or civil war. Yes, that's true. And that's why we do have insurance policies on all of our properties on top of having them in LLCs. Putting a property under an LLC does not protect you from negligence and the amount of money the LLC has in assets doesn't matter to whether or not they can be liable for any amount of damages caused by negligence. Damages are determined in civil trials by the jury after both sides argue their cases in regards to damages caused not based on the assets the company has. LLC stands for limited liability, not no liability. So again, the whole point of this is that whatever happens, you know, in the worst case scenario, most that you can lose is whatever is in this one LLC. Now, of course, things change if there's fraud involved or if you did something on purpose to intentionally injure somebody. But in the case of a simple accident that maybe severely injures someone, you're only limited to damages within the one LLC and it won't affect your personal assets. You mean every property should have a separate LLC, one house, one LLC. So in the ideal situation, Yes, you're supposed to have one property per LLC to severely limit the damage, but realistically, getting sued for such a large amount that you lose everything in one fell swoop is very, very low. Owning multiple LLCs does have overhead costs, so it's not free to have an infinite amount of LLCs. It's not free to maintain them every single year as well. Tax Replay says, can they sue if they were on private property or is this about public property? They could definitely sue you if this is on private property as well. Dockside asks, how do you put a property under an LLC without triggering the due on sale clause on the mortgage? It's a fantastic question. The truth is, most lenders do not want you to move your properties from your personal name to your LLC, but they also don't care. So as long as you're continuously making the payments, they usually don't look into it too much. All right, let's go in the last video. I'm gonna buy an infinite amount of houses for the price of one. You can't do that. The math doesn't add up. Yes, I can. Let's say I buy this rundown home for $100,000 and put 20,000 into it to fix it up. Okay, so you're in it for 120. The after repair value is approximately $200,000. And once it's all complete, I'll be able to go to the bank and get a cash out refinance for 75% of its new value. So this is basically the birth strategy where you buy a property that's pretty run down, you put money into repairing it, you find a chance to rent it out, then you do a cash out refinance to get all your money back out and then some. So wait, you're gonna end up getting $150,000 from the bank? That's more than what you put into it. Yep, and that money is tax-free because it's a loan and I'm not taking any profit. Loans are tax-free, but of course you have to pay it back plus some interest. So again, you have to make sure that the numbers make sense and not to pull out too much money that you're losing money every single month. Aren't your mortgage payments gonna be really high if you do that though? They might be, but I'll be renting this home out and the tenant's rent will cover the mortgage payments, insurance, property taxes, and property management fees. Wow, so for $120,000, you're going to be able to get a property that gives you back $150,000 tax-free while still letting you keep it as a cash-flowing rental property. Exactly. It's called the Burr strategy and allows me to keep buying rental properties over and over again with the same amount of money. And the beauty of the Burr strategy is you can do this an infinite amount of times because you're reusing the same amount of capital over and over again. What happens if a couple of tenants default and you don't have the cash on hand to fund multiple mortgages? So that's why we keep a lot of cash reserves for any random repairs or vacancies. In our situation, if some tenants stop paying rent, we actually have enough in cash reserves to cover these payments and expenses for many years to come. k Back says, if it's too good to be true, start a housing crisis. So the housing crisis was actually started because a lot of real estate investors were buying cash flow negative properties on variable interest rate mortgages. So they were buying these properties that barely gave them enough rent to sustain the property and they were on variable interest rate loans, which meant that at some point, their low interest rate increased to a higher interest rate and suddenly they really couldn't make the payments anymore and had to let it go. They were also not qualified for those mortgages when they got them in the first place. Sure, you can do this, but you're taking on infinite risk. This is how people who think they know what they're doing end up going bankrupt after being $2 million in debt. So yes, it's true. 
You should not be doing this if you do not know how to do math. It's pretty simple to know exactly how much your mortgage is gonna be. It's simple to understand how much rents are gonna be if you know the markets well. So if these numbers don't make sense, then don't buy the property and don't do the strategy. Only so much leverage banks will let you accumulate. Your debt to income ratio will be impacted and put a drag on your borrowing power. You cannot get infinite debt without infinite income. Also, cash out refi would only be advantageous to you in a low APR environment, not high ones like now. Cost of borrowing is very high, so good luck on getting a bank to give you the money and share that risk. So that's a very good point. Typically, banks will only let you have 10 active loans at one time, and then you would need to sell a property or refinance in order to continue borrowing. But there are ways around this limitation. So there are something called DSCR loans out there. So debt service coverage ratio loans. And these are loans that are a little bit higher in interest rates, but they are loans based on the cash flow that the property produces. All right, Charles says, where I find confusing is how oftentimes these real estate YouTube channels just like to say higher value for revaluation. How can anyone be so sure if the house bought for $100,000 and an additional $20,000 spent on renovation will be revalued at $200,000? That's where either the lie is or a hidden secret is. It's more so finding the right opportunities. So we're not just buying properties that are on the MLS that everyone has seen, that's in a good school district that everyone just wants to buy, it's already ready. We try to look for hidden gems. These are properties that the seller has not maintained in a very long time. They usually have a very decrepit look to it, but we're basically turning a really, really distressed property into something that's livable again. So if you know that properties in this area sell for around $250,000, and you buy a property for 100,000 that needs 50,000 worth of work, well then you know, okay, if I buy it for 100,000, put 50,000 into it, then it'll be worth 250. And the bank can see that's worth 250 because that's how appraisers do their appraisals. So I hope this was helpful. This was an in-depth look at my short form content. I wanted to be able to explain to you guys how everything worked. But if you guys still have some questions that you're not sure about, go ahead and leave me a comment down in the comment section below. And if you guys wanna see more explanations of some of my more popular YouTube shorts videos, then go ahead and check out this video over here. Thanks for watching, you guys. Appreciate it, and I'll see you next time. Take care.